Okay. Okay. So thanks for the introduction. This work was done with, uh, in collaboration with Tyler Johnson, who's now at Atmos, uh, and Mark Johnson, who's now, who was always at Rolls Royce. The preview of the talk is shown in this graph here, where we see that we've measured a different, a size dependence of Mac for different sources, but models do not reproduce this. So now to put that in context, um, I'm talking about the mass absorption cross section of soot. This is the ratio of absorption coefficient to mass concentration. And when you define that ratio, you have some choice of what you mean by especially mass concentration. In this talk, I'm gonna be using the mass concentration of non-volatile PM produced by combustion sources because the first definition here is not well-defined. When I say soot, I mean this kind of material, flame synthesized nano aggregates of nearly graphitic graphite yeah, carbon spherules. I don't think anybody in this audience doesn't know what I mean. And uh, just to go through some of the key properties of soot, which are normally used for measurement, soot is insoluble, soot is highly light absorbing, soot is made up of contorted graphene layers, therefore has a sp2 dominated molecular structure, and therefore also vaporizes at very high temperatures. And when we measure soot or sometimes NVPM or sometimes black carbon, people usually mean the exact same material when they use these different terms. Uh, we perform measurements based on those properties and we come up with different names if we're trying to be very specific about the measurements. But my point here is that many of these measurements rely on an, um, on an assumed MAC. So when we talk about EBC, we're actually talking about light absorption, but expressing it in units of equivalent mass by assuming a MAC. When we talk about EC, or when we measure, sorry, EC or RBC, we need the soot to have a high MAC for the RBC measurement from Pulse LAI. And we need, we assume something about the MAC when we're doing the EC measurement because we have an optical correction involved. In contrast, uh, continuous wave LAI and Raman spectroscopy mass spectrometry are not influenced by MAC. So when we talk about MAC, uh, you may prefer to think in terms of refractive index or uh, absorption function E of M, which is a simple function of refractive index. Uh, if, you, if you do so, you will be assuming a Riley W. Gans model, and this model will come back later in the talk. So first of all, in the big picture, this is not the first time anyone's measured MAC. MAC has been measured for decades. And a recent review of in-situ measurements has concluded that a representative MAC for most of sources is about eight meters squared per gram. This result is consistent with the, um, the previous, the, the widely used result from Bond and Bergstrom where they reviewed all previous measurements and reached 7.5 meters squared per gram. And also this is consistent with measurements of E of M where uh, uh, in the combustion literature, which were not previously considered by that review. So there was a paper uh, four years ago in carbon where a size resolved MAC was reported. Actually in an earlier talk today by Reza Kolgi site referenced these data. And in that talk, something of a power law was demonstrated. But if you look a little bit more closely at these data, you might notice that the excluding the nitrogen diluted samples, we actually have something of a plateau here and maybe some outliers there. But it's still there's a question of why, why is the size dependence observed and is it more broadly observed in different sources? So there are a few different hypotheses that we can find in the literature for why there might be a size resolved MAC or size dependent MAC. Uh, well, the null hypothesis is that there wouldn't be one. If you extend that hypothesis by accounting for aggregate internal scattering, you would result, you would calculate uh, an absorption cross section as shown on the right, where, you, where the uh, accurate numerical model here predicts something like a 25, 30% increase, depending on the size of the monomers, the wavelength that you're using. And at some point that may decrease slightly. So I refer to this as internal scattering because this means that we actually do have interaction between the monomers, unlike the RDG model. Another feature or another hypothesis that we can uh, bring up is a correlation between monomer and aggregate size, which was first reported by uh, Steve Rojak's group. 
And this was actually measured in that same study that I mentioned that I showed a couple of slides ago. As usual, there was a size dependence observed between primary particle and overall aggregate size. Another hypothesis is quantum confinement, which was first reported by Hai Wang's group and was parameterized in a nice study by Kedesidis and Pratsinis, where uh, this quantum confinement effect, which boils down to uh, an optical band gap, uh, which is correlated with the aggregate size. So therefore it can be parameterized with aggregate size and it results in this kind of trend in this study, which I would plot later in the context of our results. Finally, you could hypothesize that there's a size dependent maturity to soot. And there is, to my knowledge, no quantitative model of this effect. So in this study, we're going to report results from uh, the CIRMS, the CPMA electrometer reference mass standard. This is normally used for calibration, but in this study, we use it and interpret the results in terms of MAC. We have a, diff a few different sources. So this is simplified here because the setup varied. We use the CPMA electrometer to charge particles, select them by mass to charge ratio, and then measure the mass concentration coming out and the absorption coefficient after the CPMA. The key detail of this setup is that we use a UDAC, which is a, a corona charger, which gives us an extremely high number of charges per particle. And because of those high number of charges per particle, we actually end up with something like a log normal distribution coming out of the CPMA. So we can use the mean or the mode CPMA mass, output mass, to represent the single particle mass of the particles coming out. We don't have to worry about multiple charge correction. It's built into our setup. So here's the, here are our main set of results. Uh, the plot is a little bit detailed, but overall you see a trend where the, the MAC starts off lower, increases, and then seems to stabilize. This trend is not completely clear for the different sources because of the different ranges of single particle mass that you see for the different sources here. And the, that is, this range that you see is limited not by our setup, but by the available particles to measure. So when these measurements stop at this position, that means that there are no significant massive particles to the left. And over here, uh, we've reached the maximum we've measured already the largest particles that were present. The different sources that you see here are an aircraft turbine engine in red, an Argonaut inverted flame burner, which was measured with three different instruments, uh, MSS plus, a PAX, and a CAPS. These are also using different physical techniques between the CAPS and the PAX. We have also measured a minicast diffusion burner at three different settings representing different studies in the literature and a diesel generator over a couple of different days. The diesel generator was not extremely stable, but it still fits the overall trend that we see here. A key point here is that at the upper range of the masses or sizes that you see here, the MAC is consistent with that MAC reported by Liretel. So the average non-size resolved MAC is consistent with the size resolved MAC. To plot this a little bit differently, these are the same data on the top, but they've been exploded so you can see them a bit more clearly. And for to allow you to compare different panels, I've copied the fit, a sigmoidal fit from one panel to the next. So the red data here, this red line is reproduced on all the other panels. And for the blue data, for the blue dashed line, that's reproducing the Dustin Poirotel study that I started showing you, started off by showing you. So I've also added here on the bottom panels uh, a couple of other literature studies. Here are the data from Reza Kolge, which he actually presented earlier today. Over here are data from one study, which measured at three different sizes, and another study, which measured at three different wavelengths, a few different sizes, and actually reviewed uh, a larger number of laboratory measurements than any other study in this, in this uh, figure. So now here, we can add on that layer of modeling, adding those same models that I mentioned before, representing the same concepts that were hypothesized from literature. We can, in short, we cannot reproduce this size dependence. What these models are showing you are, is um, first a me model, which is physically unrepresentative and it's only included here because it was hypothesized uh, from an earlier study to be useful. 
Second, the null hypothesis of no interaction, which of course produces no size dependence because if you have a larger aggregate with non-interacting spheres, there's no effect. Second, for uh, the internal scattering accounted for with a generalized uh, multi-sphere me model. And these two are more or less overlaid, but there's an, in, uh, sorry, both of them are flat, but the GMM model has a higher amount than the other model. This is not the point today. The point today is that there is no size dependence in either one. When we account for monomer aggregate size correlation, still no size dependence. When we account for quantum confinement, still no size dependence in this range, because both of those require a much, uh, a decrease to much smaller sizes. The final point I want to mention here is that there is not a consist the, the the different measurements from different studies seem to produce different asymptotic max at the highest sizes, whereas our measurements all seem to produce all seem to report similar max at the higher sizes, and that suggests that there's more uncertainty between laboratories than between sources in terms of variability in reported max. The other thing is that those curves don't overlay in terms of how fast they go down and where they start going down, which suggests that there's uh, some material difference between the from these sources. So to summarize, we've observed the size dependent MAC for multiple different diffusion flames and real world, so real world sources. We've seen trends that vary between sources, as I just said. This effect would have the largest impact for smallest particles, of course, and that means aviation soot emissions and emissions from newer automotive vehicles. None of the literature hypotheses that I identified predict this size dependence Mac, uh, of MAC, and therefore this must be attributed to a decrease in soot maturity for smaller sizes. Thanks for your attention. I welcome any questions or comments uh, at my email here. Great, thank you so much, Joel. Really comprehensive review of, of previous results as well as explanation of yours. So we already have a number of questions in the, um, in the chat here. So um, Jerome says, thanks Joel, if, if mass is selected by CPMA, CPMA slash APM, maybe multiple charged particles can produce an overprediction of MAC? Question mark. That comes back to this uh, depiction here. So if we norm the, when we think about multiple charges as, as aerosol scientists, we usually are familiar with the, uh, um, a bipolar charger followed by a DMA, for example. And then you would have a few charges. So you'd have one, two, three. And here that would produce some confusion if you had a log normal distribution centered around each of those. But after the CPMA, uh, after the corona charger CPMA, we have so many charges that if you consider a log normal distribution centered around each of these numbers, it just overlays to produce another log normal distribution. So we don't, it's not a problem in our setup. Okay, yeah, that's clear. Um, so Reza has two. Um, what is the range on slide 17? What is the range of particle diameter for the agglomerates? Uh, I've actually plotted diameter on the top here. Mm -hmm. I, I, I missed to say this, but this mobility diameter um, I, I, on the next slide, it's called soot mobility diameter because this is predicted using the universal effective density relationship reported by uh, Olfert and Rojak. So okay. we would expect this mapping. If the structure was not DLCA soot, then it would be a little bit off. Okay, good. Um, and then I'll just take raises together here. Ah, he means mean primary particle diameter inside seven. Oh, oh. Um, sorry, I might have misheard. So I, I can show you the, 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 the numbers. Um, it's, oh, yeah. So the numbers we have are, are here. Um, these are from various sources. It's there, I, I thought there might be a trend with mean particle diameter. We looked for it, we modeled it and it doesn't seem to explain the results. Okay, good. Um, and then Martin Irwin has a couple. Um, could you comment on the uncertainties in the different measurements? Are the variations in MAC outside of these, say the uncertainty ranges for the measurement principles yeah. themselves? It's a good question. I, I kind of was getting at it um, when I mentioned the difference 
if you look at our data versus literature data, um, there seems to be more, our, our measurements are very consistent. So for example, here we've measured uh, with three different instruments. One of these measurements we actually, so we've measured with three different instruments and we've gotten the same result. We've gotten a very similar trend. We've repeated this particular one on a few different occasions during the course of this work, which was about a year. And it's, it's I, I don't think that is our main source of uncertainty. Um, the calibration itself in terms of whether the results should be here or everything should be shifted up, that's a question that could be asked, but I, there is clearly more variability with size than with anything else in our measurements and in the literature. Mm -hmm. Just offset from one another. But yeah, that's, yes. it's striking how similar the shape, those profiles are relative to one another. Um, following from that, Martin also asked, um, Further, how strongly is charging? Oh, that just went off my screen. Is charging by the UDAC affected by the fractal index? Um, that's a it's a good question. There is um, there is a point at which charging models for fractal particles versus spheres diverges, and I think it's about hundred nanometers. So, um, and but the divergence is not very rapid. So, this is. I'm not sure what else I can say. <laughs> that, okay, that's, sure. it, it's an it's an issue which which we we think we have constrained well. Okay, good. Um, we've got still another minute for questions here. Steve Rojak has a couple of a, a comment there that Dastin for his explanation that the soot maturity was correlated with primary particle size, which then in turn is correlated with the aggregate mass. So yes. that would yeah. There's actually a follow up study from Steve's group, which I'll. <laughs> extend his comment with because they then they did more Raman spectroscopy to show that even even more clearly uh, with Baldelli and Rojak. Okay well good and then so he he then follows that on if the cause of the MAC changes from maturity maybe we need to measure the primary particle size more directly. Well I we don't have evidence right now that primary particle size predicts soot maturity I can't say that it's not, we don't know it doesn't, but we don't have good evidence that it does. Yeah, that's not correlated necessarily. Great. Well, obviously this invoked uh, a lot of discussion. Thanks, Joel, so much for these uh, results and we look forward to seeing the, the future work.